Karsten Klunder and his friend Dirt Deckard dreamed of traveling, sailing, and surfing. Those were pie-in-the-sky dreams for two men living in tightly controlled East Germany. They hatched a plan to use their passions in a bid for freedom. There were some patrols along the coast, but it still appeared to be less dangerous than other possible escape routes. Early one morning in November 1986, they approached the sea with their surfboards. They were going to surf to Denmark. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. The end of World War II signaled an unsure future for the defeated Germany. Between the Yalta and Potsdam peace conferences, it was decided to split Germany into four allied zones, the eastern part of the country going to the Soviet Union to control, and the western parts going to the United States, Britain, and eventually France. West Germany was technically the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, or Federal Republic of Germany, and East Germany was the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, German Democratic Republic, or GDR. Despite Berlin sitting entirely in the eastern part of the country, and I constantly have to remind myself that Berlin was nowhere near the east-west divide, the city was also divided into similar zones. The mere existence of West Berlin, a conspicuously capital city deep within the communist East Germany, quote, stuck like a bone in the Soviet throat, according to Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. So tenuous were the relations between the East and West that Russia began plotting to drive the U.S., Britain, and France out of Berlin for good. In 1948, a Soviet blockade of West Berlin was set up, blocking off all rail and road access in an effort to starve the Western allies out of the city. In one of the most dramatic standoffs in the history of the Cold War, the Berlin blockade saw the U.S. and its allies supplying their sectors of the city from the air. Known as the Berlin Airlift, the Allied nations flew in more than 2.3 million tons of food, fuel, and other supplies over the course of a year, until the Soviets finally gave up and ended the blockade. Things were relatively calm for a while, but in the late 1950s, the Soviets noticed a trend developing. People saw how life on the capitalist side was recovering faster than life on the communist side, not to mention there were a lot fewer spies keeping tabs on regular folks on the western side, and people began to emigrate. This was especially true of doctors, scientists, and skilled professionals, resulting in a serious brain drain in the East, which got worse year over year. Khrushchev ordered the East German government to stop the flow of emigrants for good. On the night of August 12, 1961, in one night, barbed wire barriers, blockade, and even some sections of brick and mortar wall were constructed. It was later reinforced multiple times to become an impenetrable 12 foot or 3.7 meter high concrete wall, roughly 100 miles or 161 kilometers long. Complete with no man's land, landmines, guard dogs, guard towers, and checkpoints. The relatively fluid border, which had until that point allowed some 60,000 East Germans to commute daily to good-paying jobs in the West, visit family and friends, attend soccer games, and so on, was gone. With no warning, whatever side of the border you went to sleep on on August 12th, that was where you stayed for the next 28 years. This opposing structure didn't stop people from trying to make a great escape to the West. Roughly 171 people, some of them defecting Soviet soldiers, lost their lives trying to cross the border. But over 5,000 more succeeded. And some of them got really creative with it. But the first person to cross that foreboding line just hopped over it. When the wall was three days old, much of it was not actually a wall at all, but sections of barbed wire fence, though with soldiers and police to enforce it. One of those was 18-year-old Konrad Schumann, stationed at the corner of Bernauerstrasse and Rupenerstrasse. 
He might have been young, but he could tell which way the wind was blowing. He wanted out of the GDR, like now. He paced his beat nervously, while chain-smoking and occasionally pushing down the barbed wire coil. It was only two feet high. While the other guards were distracted by a gathering crowd, Schumann swapped out his loaded submachine gun for an unloaded and therefore lighter one. At 4 p.m., Schumann flicked away his cigarette, took a running start, and deftly leapt over the barrier, dropping his gun and just leaving it as he was whisked into a waiting West German police car. A West German journalist captured the leap to freedom in what would become one of the most famous images of the wall until 1989. The West loved Schumann, but many of the people he left behind considered him to be a lowly traitor. Even after he was reunited with his family after the fall of the wall a generation later, many people still shunned him as a deserter. Schumann was the first soldier from the National People's Army to escape, but it's estimated that 2,700 East German soldiers and policemen followed his example. If someone had turned your home into a prison, then you should treat it like a prison and start digging yourself a tunnel. In 1964, 30 students from West Berlin spent several months digging a 476-foot or 145-meter-long tunnel to help people in the East escape. One assumes they had to crawl to freedom because the tunnel was only about three feet high. Less than 48 hours after it was finished, the Stasi, the German Border Patrol, discovered it. But not before 57 men, women, and children had managed to escape, which I assume is why it's referred to as Tunnel 57. But many more were still waiting their turn when the GDR soldiers showed up, and in the ensuing altercation, a soldier was killed by friendly fire, which the GDR blamed on West Germany. We can't talk tunnels without mentioning the Senior Citizens Tunnel. A group of seniors spent two weeks digging a tunnel large enough that they could walk through it rather than crawl. According to one of the seniors, they went through all that extra effort because, quote, We uh, wanted to walk to freedom with our wives, comfortably and unbowed. Lots of other escape plans forewent walking entirely, preferring instead planes, trains, and automobiles. Like the plan of Heinz Meixner and Marguerite Thoreau. While working in East Berlin, Heinz and Marguerite had fallen in love and decided to get married. When GDR authorities denied their application for a marriage license, the two lovers hatched an escape plan. In May of 1963, Heinz rented a convertible, removed its windshield, and deflated the tires to make the car ride as low to the ground as possible. He drove the low rider to the famous Checkpoint Charlie with Marguerite and her mother hiding in the back. As they reached the inspection guards, Heinz ducked down and slammed on the gas. The car was low enough to eke under the barrier, and the two lovers, plus mom, sped to freedom. But maybe you want something beefier than an open-top car when you're trying to get past men with rifles. Wolfgang Engels, a civilian employed by the East German Army as a driver, decided communism had lost all its appeal. Instead of relying on agility like Schumann or speed like Meixner, Engels went for brute force. He spotted a parked PSW-152 six-wheeled armored troop transport vehicle and borrowed it. He drove toward the wall, stopping to yell to strangers, I'm waiting for the West. Who's coming? No one took him up on the offer. Engels then put his foot down and hurtled a pace into the concrete barrier. He smashed into it, but not through it. The PSW was embedded in the wall, but critically, the door was still on the east side. Engels leapt from the vehicle, ran across the no-man's land between barriers known as the Death Strip, and climbed on the second barrier. The Grenstruppen guards shot him. They had standing orders to shoot on sight anyone trying to get across. Bullet wound notwithstanding, Engels still managed to climb the wall, but he got entangled in the barbed wire, and the guard shot him again, this time in the back. 
Finally, a West Berlin border guard saw what was happening and gave Engel cover fire. But by that time, Engels had lost consciousness. Luckily, some West Berliners drinking in a nearby pub rushed to his aid, freed Engels from the wire, and took him back to the bar. He woke up on the bar counter. When I turned my head and saw all the Western brands of liquor on the shelf, I knew that I had made it. If one car is good, how about a bunch of cars in a line? Or as the technical types call it, a train? In December 1961, 27-year-old engineer Harry Dieterling discovered a section of unused train track that was slated to be demolished so that the wall could be completed across its path. But it still ran into West Berlin, at least for the next five days. Time was short not only for the track, but for Dieterling himself. He was about to be sent to a labor and re-education camp after refusing to comply with state programs. He volunteered to drive a train that ran on the nearest route and plotted what he called the last train to freedom. Dieterling invited 24 family members and friends on board and had them sit in the foremost car, along with seven other people who just happened to be in the car already and had no idea what was about to happen. When Dieterling approached the last station, instead of slowing down, he opened up the throttle and disconnected the safety brake so that no one could stop the train. The border guards were so taken by surprise, they didn't fire a single shot. The runaway train smashed full speed into the temporary border barrier, finally stopping in the West Berlin district of Spandau, where I assumed they all went to the ballet. Bando ballet joke. They actually had a song called Through the Barricades, but it was about another war-torn, bifurcated city, Belfast, Ireland. Speaking of ballet and other flexible performer types, one man used his skills as a trapeze artist to make his escape. In December 1962, Horst Klein found himself banned from performing because of his anti-communist beliefs. He noticed a cable spanning the barricades and death zone, and a light bulb went off. He was going to do what he did best. Under cover of darkness, Klein climbed an electric utility pole, reached the high-voltage cable, didn't immediately electrocute himself, which is always a plus, and started moving hand over hand over the wall. Dangling 60 feet or 18 meters above the guards, Klein was outside the range of the searchlights but he was far from safety. Unfortunately, he also wasn't wearing gloves, and it was winter in Germany. His hands became numb in the cold. He lost his grip and fell, breaking both of his arms when he crashed to earth. But luckily, he crashed on the western side of the wall. I, for one, am grateful that I've never had to consider risking my life and limb for a better life somewhere else. I'm also really grateful for all of my wonderful listeners, particularly those who leave reviews and who support the show at patreon.com slash yourbrainonfacts, including Stefan, Troy, OJ, Jesse, Snickerdoodle, which is just adorable, and Ruth Ann. They all have a special bonus mini episode to look forward to the day after this episode drops, one of two that they get each month. And while I'm thanking people by name, I want to thank Anna again for tipping me off to the fact that I wasn't seeing Amazon reviews for the Your Brain on Facts book from listeners in other countries. So this one comes to us from Australia. Just says Amazon customers, sorry I don't know your name. I am a trivia hound of the highest order. I'm the happiest I can be when I'm in a comfy chair with some P&Q and a great book. Even better, a great book full of scrumptious trivia tidbits. You will learn lots and have a great time doing it. And best of all, I'm a keen listener of the Wyboff podcast, so I read the entire book in the smooth, witty voice of the author and podcast presenter herself. Moxie, I'm waiting eagerly for a sequel, but enjoying weekly drops of Wyboff in the meantime. Never stop. Well, if I had any damn sense, I would have stopped already, so I think you're good there. And, um, what does P&Q mean in this context? If any of my gentle listeners know, assuming the reviewer doesn't themselves tell me, hop on the social media, Facebook and Instagram, your Brain on Facts, Twitter at Brain on Facts Pod, and let me know. 
By the way, sharing social media posts from your favorite podcast is still one of the top ways to support a show. I'd also love it if you tag your favorite shows and tell them that they should submit a fact to the 150th episode of Your Brain on Facts, which is coming up in about a month, for which I have applied but still not heard back for a Guinness World Record for the most guest segments on a single podcast episode, because we're going to have 50 guest facts on that one. Over on the podcast review side of things, we've got one from Apple Podcasts and one from Podchaser, which is like the IMDb of podcasts, and a great place to review shows you like when your app doesn't let you do that. Irish Karen Kay says, Please, do yourself a huge favor and listen to this podcast. This is the first podcast I've ever followed, and to say that I'm addicted is an understatement. The topics are well-researched and just downright entertaining, and you can't beat the smooth, dulcet tones of Moxie LaBouche. Moxie covers every topic, from gallstones and kidney stones, to the colors of food, Jewish people who authored popular Christmas songs, and things that 80s kids were taught to fear. Wyboff is without a doubt the best podcast around. Thank you so much, Irish Karen. And Jeremy P underscore 86 says, Queen of the Segway. Moxie is so witty and has such an amazing voice. All of her segways make me giggle a little bit every time. She is funny and entertaining, all while having the knowledge of an encyclopedia. Love this podcast. Keep up the good work, Moxie. You're giving me a great deal of credit there, Jeremy, and I do appreciate it. I have all the knowledge. I just don't know where I left it. And if you want to hear your opinions read out on the show, all you have to do is leave the book or the podcast a review. Fleeing to Freedom was a family affair for the Bethka brothers, Ingo, Holger, and Egbert. 21-year-old Ingo dreamed of seeing the world, but living in a communist country, that ain't gonna happen, Captain. Ingo had become familiar with the Elba River while serving as a border guard and decided that was his lucky horse. But first, he had to get to the river. To reach the bank, Ingo had to get past a metal fence while not hitting the trip wires that would activate the floodlights. After that was the barbed wire barrier, and after that was a minefield. Through luck and or skill, Ingo made it past all of that and down to the river, where he deployed his secret weapon, an air mattress, which he blew up and silently paddled to the other side. The Stasi found the air mattress, and the GDR outlawed air mattresses in East Germany. That's the reason why, to this day, air mattresses come with a warning label saying not to use them as rafts. No, I'm just yanking your chain. After Ingo's defection, both the Elba River and his brother Holger came under scrutiny. Eight years later, it was time for Holger to plot his getaway, but he'd have to find another route. For weeks, Holger and an unnamed friend prepared for the escape by working out and practicing archery. In March of 1983, the two dressed as electricians to get into a carefully selected building where they hid in the attic. At night, Holger shot a nylon line over the wall using the bow and arrow. After two failed attempts. Third time lucky, which was handy because they only had three arrows. Ingo was waiting on the other side to receive the nylon cable, to which Holger tied a steel cable, with its end anchored around a chimney. Ingo tied the line to his car and pulled it taut, and Holger launched himself down it with a pulley like a zip line. But the line wasn't steep enough, and Holger ran out of momentum before he got to the end. Going back was not an option, so Holger went hand over hand the rest of the way until he could drop down onto a balcony on the west side. There was one brother left, so on to plan three. Ingo and Holger took flying lessons and got their hands on two ultralight planes, which they painted in military colors, complete with Soviet-style red stars under the wings, and added beefier engines so the little aircraft could carry two people instead of one. The brothers themselves were decked out in fake Russian pilot uniforms, a coy communist cosplay. The two brothers flew eastward over the wall, landed in East Berlin, and picked up the very surprised Egbert. Miraculously, they were able to do this and fly back to West Berlin without interference. Egbert later recalled, I thought 
I'd never see my brothers again. And they came out of the sky like angels and took me to paradise. The Bethke brothers weren't the only people to fly to freedom in the West. Presenting... My favorite Berlin Wall escape of them all. Friends Gunter Wetzel, a mason by trade, and Peter Strelzik, an electrician and former Air Force mechanic, put their heads together to brainstorm a plan. Plan A, build a helicopter. They quickly realized that was perhaps a teeny bit overly ambitious, difficult to source parts for starters. So they went for the next best thing, a hot air balloon. Accounts differ as to whether they were inspired by a television program about ballooning or a magazine article about the International Balloon Festival in Albuquerque. The balloon would need to carry a total of eight people, two men, two wives, and four children, ages 2 to 15, plus the weight of the proposed gondola, about 1,650 pounds total, or 750 kilos. Subsequent math, and I'll take their word for it, said that the balloon would need to hold about 71,000 cubic feet or 2,000 cubic meters of air, meaning the balloon would need to be 8,600 square feet or 800 square meters of fabric. That was a pretty tall order in the small town where they lived and was guaranteed to both fail and attract attention. They drove an hour to a department store in a larger town where they told the surprised clerk that they needed 930 yards or 850 meters worth of fabric to make tent linings for their camping club. Wetzel spent two weeks sewing the cloth into a balloon-shaped bag, 50 by 66 feet or 15 by 20 meters, on a manually operated sewing machine from the 30s. Strelzik was on gondola and burner duty. The gondola was a simple square platform of sheet metal with little posts at the corners, strung with clotheslines as the wall. There's a link in the show notes to a video of the actual balloon in a museum. Definitely check it out, because that gondola was a tragedy waiting to happen. On an April night in 1978, they found a secluded forest clearing about 6 miles or 10 kilometers from the border in which to test the balloon. The burner failed to inflate the balloon, which they attributed to the fact that it was laid out on the ground. To get around this, they found an 80-foot or 25-meter cliff at a rock quarry where they could suspend the balloon vertically. The homemade balloon, which would have both of their families held in by a bloody piece of string, but that didn't work either. Plan B3, fill the balloon with regular air first, with a blower made from a 14 horsepower motorcycle engine powered by jumper cables off of Strelzik's car. To heat the air faster, they got it started with a homemade flamethrower. A homemade flamethrower. MacGyver's got nothing on this guy. You see, kids, MacGyver was a television show. Ah, uh, never mind, ask your grandparents. They went back to the clearing, but the balloon still wouldn't inflate. One reason the blower illustrated was that the cotton they were using was far too porous for a balloon. Their unsuccessful effort had cost them the equivalent of six grand, and Strelzik had to burn the fabric a little at a time to dispose of it, their money and dreams literally going up in smoke. The pair began testing samples of different kinds of fabric, from dress taffeta, which worked fairly well, to umbrella material, which worked really well but was the most expensive. They drove more than two hours to buy fabric this time, with the cover story that they needed a massive quantity of fabric to make sales for their sailing club. The store didn't keep that much material on hand and would have to order it in, leaving the family biting their nails that the store would report them to the Stasi. But the order came in without incident. They also splashed out for an electric motor for the sewing machine. Wetzel spent the next week sewing the second balloon, and they returned to the forest clearing and, will wonders never cease, the blower-flamethrower combo had the bag inflated in about five minutes. The bag lifted and stayed up, but the burner on the gondola wasn't powerful enough to create the heat needed to actually get them off the ground. 
back to the drawing board to tinker with different fuels and more tanks. They were getting nowhere, and Wetzel wanted to abandon the balloon plan entirely, switching to a homemade glider or small plane. Strelzik continued trying to work on the burner, and he got a bigger flame by turning the propane tanks upside down. And this wasn't some weekend project. It took 14 months between the first test and cracking the secret of the burner. On the 3rd of July, 1979, with weather conditions favorable, the Strelzik family lifted from the forest clearing at 1.30 a.m. and reached an altitude of 6,600 feet or 2,000 meters, which they knew thanks to Strelzik's homemade altimeter. The gentle wind was blowing them toward freedom in West Germany when the balloon entered a cloud. Water vapor condensed on the balloon, and that added so much weight it caused the balloon to descend at the edge of a minefield only 600 feet or 180 meters from the border. The family spent nine hours hiking the nine miles back to the car and their launch equipment and made it home just in time to call out sick from work and school. They couldn't drag the balloon back with them and it was discovered later that morning. Strelzik destroyed everything remaining regarding the balloon and even sold his car in case someone had seen it. The Stasi asked the public to turn in the perpetrator of a serious offense, with a list of all the items left at the crash site. The men decided their best, and only chance, was to build another balloon as quickly as they could. They doubled the balloon's size. Between that and trying even harder to avoid notice, they bought the 13,000 square feet or 1,200 square meters of fabric in smaller quantities of various colors and types from shops all over the country. The balloon also required an astonishing 3.7 miles or 6 kilometers of thread. Wetzel sewed the third balloon and Strelzik rebuilt everything else. They were ready in six weeks this time and on the night of September 15th, a thunderstorm created the winds they would need and they went back to the forest clearing. It only took about 13 minutes to get the balloon fully inflated. They lifted off, but when they went to cut the ground tethers, they didn't do it in perfect sync. The gondola tilted and the burner caught the fabric of the balloon on fire. They put it out with a fire extinguisher and the balloon was able to reach that 6,600 foot height in about nine minutes drifting west at 19 miles or 30 kilometers per hour. The temperature up there was 18 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 8 Celsius. And again, I cannot stress this enough, the walls of the gondola were railings of clothesline. A design flaw in the burner caused the flame to be too high and the balloon split. The rush of air put out the flame. Wetzel was able to relight the flame with a match, which he would have to do several more times before they landed. The tear meant that they had to use the burner much more often to stay aloft, meaning faster fuel consumption and thus a shorter distance that could be covered, a difference of as much as 30 miles or 50 kilometers. At one point, they increased the flame to the maximum possible and rose to 8,200 feet or 2,500 meters high enough to be detected, though not identified, by West German air traffic controllers. They had also been spotted by an East German night watchman who reported the unidentified flying object heading toward the border, and border guards turned on the searchlights, but the balloon was already too high. When the propane ran out, they descended quickly, with little idea of where they were. The men ventured out cautiously and noticed small farms with modern equipment, starkly different from the centralized farms and old equipment they were used to seeing. Two Bavarian police officers had seen the balloon's flickering flame and headed to where they thought it would land. Strelzik and Wetzel were relieved to see that the police were driving an Audi, another sign that they were in fact in West Germany. They'd landed near the town of Nyla, only six miles or 10 kilometers west of the border and the only injury that was suffered was Wetzel, who broke his leg on the landing. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. Back to Klunder and Deckert. Deckert damaged his wetsuit early doors and turned back. 
it was too dangerous to be in the freezing water for hours without the protection. Unaware of this, Klunder went on, nearly completely exhausted by the time he spotted the Danish coast hours later. Klunder worried that Deckert had been caught, but Deckert went home, fixed his wetsuit, and set out alone the next day. To his surprise, after six hours of surfing, he saw a Danish fishing boat, which was specifically out looking for him, telling him that Klunder had made it safely to Denmark. But even with the successful escape, Deckert said, If I had known that the wall would fall three years later, I would have stayed. Definitely. And thank you to our guest quote readers in order of appearance, CJ from the Been Through Some Sh** podcast, Maddox from Break a Wish, Tori from Hutch and Strutton, and Eric from Play It By Ear. You can find all of their shows linked in the show notes. Remember, you can always find the script for the show and the source notes at yourbrainonfacts.com. Thanks for spending part of your day with me, and stay safe.